Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to join our first Applied Designer this semester. So today we are very happy and it's, um, yeah, it's so exciting to have Professor Louis Scott, um, which is from Via Gallery uh, from Smithsonian Institute, to give us a very interesting talk about making ports in mainland Southeast Asia. So let us give a uh, big hand to Professor uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Does this microphone work? Is that okay? Thank you all for coming um, at lunchtime. Uh, and thank you, Sherry, for arranging this chance to speak to everyone. Uh, I'm going to be sharing with you um, summarizing the results of a long-term field uh, research project that took place between uh, 1989 and 2010. Uh, this was a survey of village-based pottery production in mainland Southeast Asia, and it covered villages in Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Malaysia, and also in Yunnan. Um, this, is a project that, this is a project that was done in collaboration with Okay. Um, project that was done in collaboration with Liedem Lefferts, who's a cultural anthropologist Specializing in Thailand and Laos. Why can you use the Yes. Okay. I think we'll start again. Okay. <laughs> but I do thank Sharon for arranging this opportunity to talk with all of you and to share with you um, the results of a long-term fieldwork project in mainland Southeast Asia in villages looking at the production of both stoneware and earthenware in villages of Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Malaysia, and southern Yunnan province. This was a project that began in 1989 and sort of acquired its own momentum and uh, finished in 2010. And it was conducted in collaboration with Dr. Liedem Lefferts, who is a cultural anthropologist 
with um, a deep familiarity with Northeast Thailand and Laos, and that includes language skills. I'm an art historian, although some of my best friends are anthropologists and archaeologists, and that those disciplines have had a deep impact on how I look at ceramics as an art historian, mainly historical ceramics. Um, so I came to the project with the interest in ceramics. Lidum brought his knowledge of the region, and we uh, set out to figure out what we could find out about production of ceramics in the region. Okay. This map represents all of the villages that we visited in the course of that time. Uh, somehow it all added up. Um, and more than 200 villages eventually were surveyed. Uh, looking for the distinctive patterns of production in those villages. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Uh, most of the okay. Most of the information we get about historical ceramics in mainland Southeast Asia comes not from uh, mainland Southeast Asia itself, but from excavations outside of the country, uh, countries. Um, in Indonesia and the Philippines, or from shipwrecks in particular. Um, so there's a, a big gap in our understanding of why, in the past, ceramics were made in uh, various parts of Southeast Asia. In the region itself, there's very little documentary evidence for uh, who sponsored ceramic production, how it was organized, if it was beyond the scale of village production, and uh, in particular why glazed ceramics came to be made. And uh, we don't know the role of these ceramics in the societies that produce them. Although archaeological research, particularly in Cambodia and Vietnam, is really changing that um, lack of evidence and, and filling in the picture with more details. But um, there is virtually no uh, written documentation for how indigenously produced ceramics were marketed or how they were valued by their makers or by their users. And it seems that, um, with the exception of the ceramics that were exported, um, in particular out of the port towns uh, along the coast, uh, that most ceramic production, most of the time in the past, was intended for practical everyday use and for local or regional distribution. And that is still the case today. But I emphasize that this project focused not on historical ceramics, but on looking at what was going on before our eyes, visiting the communities where pottery was still being made, talking to the potters, and most importantly, watching them from beginning to end. Uh, we documented our interviews with people, uh, which were mostly informal. We didn't have a questionnaire. We, but we had lots of questions that we had in mind. And um, we used uh, still photography at the beginning, but increasingly we came to value the role of video um, documentation of the production process. And in particular, um, what we learned is that a lot of uh, documentary films that one can see about pottery production tend to have short uh, scenes selected by the filmmaker uh, highlighting what that person assumed would be the, the main um, climactic moments of the production process. What we learned to be really important was to come with our video camera, introduce ourselves, get to know the potter, and then just sit down with the camera turned on and just sit there and let anything that happened, happen. We learned, in other words, not to edit as we were watching, but to let things unfold 
and then to use that evidence to ask questions ourselves later. Uh, so, as I showed you before, we mapped the current or recent activity in all of these centers that produce either earthenware or stoneware. Um, we typed the various procedures by which the wares are made, and we attempted, especially with regard to earthenware, to understand the variation within these types, and I'll, I'll talk with you more in detail about that, but also the relationship among these various procedures. We also wanted to understand the role uh, locally and regionally of uh, the stoneware and earthenware vessels that are still being made and distributed, to understand what created the demand for them, uh, even though it's being replaced by other materials, metal, glass, um, refrigerators, and so forth, um, and to, to try to get a sense of what the role for these ceramics had been in the region until uh, recent years. And even as I'm talking to you today, I realize that um, this project stopped now um, eight years ago, and I haven't had a chance to revisit these communities so I already was asking myself this morning how much would have changed if I had gone back before I talked to you again. I think there would be different things to say about, for example, the activities in all of these sites. I think they're probably considerably reduced from what they were even a decade or two decades ago. So in this talk, I'd like to try to sum up some of the basic understandings we reached during these survey visits and present the different productions for stoneware and earthenware and how those two uh, kinds of ceramics are used. And then in particular, I want to talk with you about the variations among earthenware producers in the region, something that came as a great surprise to us and uh, created many of the questions that we kept on asking as we moved from community to community. So let's start by um, letting me introduce to you what it was that drew me to studying ceramics in Southeast Asia, mainland Southeast Asia. I had done a lot of work previously in Japan, where the dominant stoneware production since the 16th century or so has been stoneware. There used to be lots and lots of earthenware made in Japan, but it's virtually disappeared. While I was living in Japan, I spent a lot of time looking for places to see the last production of earthenware, but they were really hard to find. Um, then I went to India, where earthenware is the dominant ceramic production. Um, high temperature ceramics are really a modern introduction through the colonial period. And um, there I was looking at the use of earthenware in a religious context. Um, potters working for a temple, making uh, pots that were used for cooking offerings. But, um, is this on now? Okay. Uh, when I got to Southeast Asia, I was truly surprised and amazed to find that both earthenware and stoneware are still being made in parallel paths in different communities. So this was the first place that I'd ever been able to see both these kinds of ceramics being offered to the market at the same time in the same place, and to um, try to get an understanding of how the two different kinds of ceramics relate to one another. Um, okay. Okay. Um, but it's also important to say that uh, this project began um, as a simple survey of pottery production within Northeast Thailand, and which is where I happen to be living. And it began with the very simple-minded assumption, looking back, that all earthenware pots are basically round-bottom pots, and they all must be made basically the same way. 
And the big discovery of this research project, the, the discovery that then drove us to yet another village for yet another survey, was the discovery that there are a variety of ways to make an earthenware pot that may look the same when it's finished. The key point in the variation is seen at the very beginning of the production, and I'll show you that. Uh, and so that was an, yet another reason why it was very important not to make judgments of what was worth being videotaped, but just to sit down and watch the whole process, because what was really revealing came right at the beginning, not the exciting part, but the basic, really fundamental part. So let's talk a bit about the roles of earthenware and stoneware in the um, mainland Southeast Asian region, broadly speaking, and wildly generalized. Um, and at least the, the roles for these ceramics that I saw in the 1990s and early uh, 2000s. And I want to emphasize here the significance of the idea of village-based production. Because uh, these are, we were looking at cases not of factory organized production, but of still largely household organized production in households within communities where one of the occupations was pottery making. But because of the seasonal variation, the pottery making was confined to the dry winter months, roughly November, December to April, when there was little or no rain, and um, it was easy to make and fire pottery. During the wet season, um, most of the people who were making pots um, turned to farming, which was the main source of income for most households. And even during the dry season, uh, Making pottery was just one option for people who were looking around very intensely for alternate ways to make money, to add to their household income. Many people signed up for work teams that went overseas to Saudi Arabia or uh, elsewhere. We used to see them in the airport in Bangkok wearing matching jackets with some um, work organization company logo on the jacket. We wish them well as they headed off to whatever they were going to do, construction projects in Taiwan, or probably lots of them came to Hong Kong, I don't know. Um, so pottery making is one of a, an assortment of occupations that people can uh, practice. And so it's not practiced with the same kind of preciousness that, for example, uh, ceramic production in Japan uh, by studio potters is practiced, or the imperial kilns in Jingdezhen, where um, the potters there were not um, doing anything but making perfect porcelain. Uh, Let's look first at earthenware and some of the ways um, that earthenware is used or was used when we were doing this survey. Earthenware production in mainland Southeast Asia is primarily the work of women. Uh, this woman was a wonderful potter. You can see her on the left, whacking away at her pot in the process of forming it, and on the right uh, with the finished pot of the same type. The Benefits of earthenware, as probably you know already, um, are its porosity, um, its capacity to allow water to seep out and evaporate through the surface, and also because of the porosity, its resistance to thermal shock, so that it can be put directly over a bonfire or a, a fire on a hearth and used for cooking. Um, so these are things that often are seen in the bigger world of ceramic um, studies as flaws or kind of commonplace traits that make earthenware not worth spending much attention on. But um, to me, by contrast, it's, these are very important properties and the production of earthenware has been key to the 
um, livelihoods and also to the living patterns of people in mainland Southeast Asia. This uh, porosity also means that earthenware firings take place with amazing rapidity. Sometimes it takes less than 30 minutes to light the fire in a bonfire stacked with pots, covered with rice straw, and have the straw burn down to um, ash and have the pots be perfectly ready to go out and be used. It's an amazing process to watch but it takes enormous control and knowledge of how to organize um, the stacking of the pots and the distribution of the fuel and then the control of the fire as it burns down. Uh, many potters in regional uh, communities had their repertories of pots of different sizes and shapes that suited the local need for pots as is the case of this woman in northern Thailand. Uh, one of the main uses throughout the region is for storing drinking water and cooling it. This is in the days before electricity was coming into villages and, and people had refrigerators proudly placed in the middle of their main rooms as, as a huge ornament for the household. They were so proud of them. But in the days before refrigeration, um, earthenware pots would be placed somewhere around the household property or often, as on the right, along the main road leading through the village so that anyone walking by who was thirsty could uh, pick up a ladle, take a drink of water, walk on, feel refreshed. And of course, the household used um, the water that way as well. Cooking pots made of earthenware were used particularly for steaming rice. Uh, this is a um, pot in a household in the central highlands of Vietnam, placed up on three bricks. In the old, old, old days, these would have been three rocks, uh, giving a firm support to the pot. And then on top of the pot, directly over the fire that's full of water, is a second pot with a perforated base that's used for um, containing the rice and for steaming it. This is sticky rice and so this is the way it needs to be cooked, to be well cooked. Uh, pots, earthenware pots though, also played big roles in the production of textiles, which was another major activity of women in many villages in mainland Southeast Asia, certainly in Northeast Thailand, in Laos, um, in Highland Vietnam. Um, here you see an uh, earthenware pot being used for fermenting indigo, for dyeing, but pots like this were also put over a fire and used for uh, reeling the silk from the silkworms that were raised in the households, in the communities. This little pot may be the kind of earthenware that outlasts any other kind uh, as <coughs> Uh, aluminum pots replace bigger pots for steaming rice, for example. Um, this is called a mogeng in Northeast Thailand, which means literally a soup pot. But in fact, it has many different uses. And in particular, it's used for steeping herbal medicine. And so if you're looking for pots in a, a town now, you can go to a pharmacy and look sort of down at the foot of the entryway and usually see a stack of earthenware pots ready for people to take off to steep their medicine. But this is a very versatile size and shape and another very key role for it, um, aside from making soup and cooking other um, dishes um, in its literal meaning, is during uh, cremation rituals. Here you see in Northeast Thailand um, the cremated remains of someone being sorted. Uh, the large bones are picked out, and some of them are put into a small pot uh, of this size, which is then wrapped in white cloth and um, uh, taken to the household or taken to the temple to be um, put in a safe place and um, be looked after by the community of monks and also the household community. 
We also saw some evidence for the use of earthenware pots in ritual. This is a small village shrine in, in southern Yunnan. Um, with, you can see the pots have been ornamented with um, peacock feathers and lotuses and um, monks' robes wrapped inside them. Turning to stoneware, uh, stoneware is a guy's activity, a men's activity in many parts of the region, but not all, as I'll show you in a minute. Uh, but certainly in Northeast Thailand, in Laos, um, stoneware production, which still goes on, is practiced by the men of the community. And um, the stoneware products that they make and distribute uh, benefit from being hard and durable. And so they are not porous. They are, are impervious to leaking from the inside or absorbing moisture from the outside. And that gives them a different role in storage, as I'll show in a minute. And then finally, um, they are fired to a high temperature in uh, enclosure, brick enclosure in these days, um, the kiln that is necessary to raise the temperature to the required temperature of about 1100 degrees centigrade to harden these pots. Um, the kilns are shared by communities of potters in the villages, typically. So they're used in rotation by teams of men who are firing the jars they've just made. And the jars are, um, again, um, made in repertories that vary from place to place, depending on um, local needs for stoneware pots. Um, here, um, you see, for example, um, in the very front right, um, a bowl with a little projection in the middle. This would be one of a set of four that would be set under a cabinet in the kitchen. The bowl would be filled with water, and this would keep ants from crawling up into the food cabinet. Uh, you see a water bottle with a conical neck used for serving water to guests. And you see a curious double rim pot that I'll um, talk about again in a minute. But bowls, basins, jars, bottles of various usable sizes. One important role for these large uh, stoneware jars is storing rainwater during the dry season, collecting it in the rainy season and then storing it during the dry season. And so houses that do not yet have access to um, water systems will um, line up a row of pots under the edge of the roof during the rainy season and allow them to fill up uh, and then cover the pots with um, usually metal lids that keeps the water clean and pure and allows it to be used as long as possible during the dry season. So these are pots that would be collecting water for use in the household but other pots of the same kind are put out in the kitchen garden or out in the fields and used similar ways for water distribution. But large uh, stoneware jars are also used for storage. This one was storing rice in a kitchen, but in the past, jars like this were also used to store textiles because you could put a lid on a jar and the rats and other Creatures that wanted to nibble on the textiles couldn't get in to um, damage them. So jars like this were all-purpose storage jars in very interesting and diverse ways. Um, here's another uh, team of potters, a husband and wife. And in the foreground, you see another particular kind of pot that's extremely useful in the kitchen. This is a pot used to keep the small fish that would be caught in the rice paddies uh, sometime during the day. The pot would be filled with water, and you can see the holes that allowed air to get in. And then the fish would be kept alive until dinner time when they would be processed. Uh, so um, a very practical and handy shape. Very similar shape, but this bottle was made for carrying around distilled liquor. 
uh, to parties and community events. Um, so a good wide flat bottom to keep it stable so that nothing would spill. Uh, I mentioned the double rim jar, and usually when I'm talking about this, I'm not thinking about the Chinese prototypes for double rim jars, but indeed, all the way back in the, if I'm correct, Han Dynasty, there are jars of this sort found in Chinese archaeological contexts. And they're still widely used in mainland Southeast Asia, specifically, particularly Northeast Thailand and Laos where fermented fish, those same little fish from the rice paddies, fermented with salt um, is a very important source of protein. It's also a condiment for cooking. It's called pladek, and it has a very strong smell. People either love it or hate it. And uh, people from central Thailand um, look down their noses at the Northeast Thai who love this um, smelly fish paste. But these jars are the jars that are made in different sizes to produce it and then to store it. Uh, you can see the range of sizes on the right. Some would be handy for keeping right inside the kitchen uh, as an immediate supply for cooking. Others would be kept under the house in a storage area. But they are made with double rims because uh, they can uh, be sealed that way. Water is poured into the space that's created between the inner rim and the outer rim. And then a conical bowl is inverted into that space with its rim down in the water, creating a seal that allows the gases during the fermentation process to escape, but again keeps insects and rodents from crawling in and uh, partaking. So it's a extremely practical shape and I would love to have someone do a project that would look more closely at the connections between how these jars are used today in China, um, were used in the past and are used in mainland Southeast Asia and think about the connections among them. Another kind of uh, stoneware vessel uh, that is almost always seen in the repertory of stoneware potters is this long-necked bottle. This is also for water, but whereas the round earthenware pots are used just for cooling water for the household to drink in a very informal way, if you were having guests come to your house, especially monks coming to give a blessing to the household or for some special occasion, a wedding or a funeral, um, a bottle like this would be brought out to give uh, water to the guest. And I wanted to show you another example, this time an earthenware bottle made um, in Burma, also southern Yunnan, and some parts of Laos. Polished, black, smoked black earthenware bottle uh, used the same way. So across mainland Southeast Asia, there quite a few variations of these shapes, but they all derive, I think, from the idea of putting water into a gourd for, shape, uh, for serving. It's very easy to see in the black earthenware bottle in particular. These are some of my favorite stoneware shapes. They're small and um, rather intimate. Um, the potter who had made these two brought them out and said that he had made both of them for his wife-to-be when he was courting her, uh, trying to convince her he was the guy. Um, the little pot on the upper left is, you, I think you can see, um, incised with ridges inside, so it's a grating bowl, and it's used to grate turmeric, which is a, a natural cosmetic, thought to make the skin very beautiful. And so, it was a very nice compliment to his beautiful bride-to-be to give her a grating dish for the turmeric. And um, her other activity must have been weaving because he also made for her the dish on the lower right, which I think you can barely see between the elephant's legs, a little opening. This is a dish used for starching the silk thread that is um, used for the warp. Um, rice paste is used for the starch. 
So the thread is run through that hole and gives, gets just enough body that it's a lot easier to set up the loom. Jars, stoneware jars are also very important for the um, main form of alcoholic entertainment in the region, which is fermented rice beer. Uh, here um, in the Central Highlands, two uh, probably Chinese jars were being used for that purpose. Um, it's a very elaborate process whereby the guest um, is seated and given a long straw and invited to start drinking. And meanwhile, the host, in this case the young woman sitting on the left, um, is there nowadays with a plastic mug, but in the old days with a buffalo horn, busily ladling more water into the jar. So it's a kind of contest between the person who's drinking and the person who's encouraging the drinking to see who stops first. Um, but this, this sort of use of rice beer is um, used for everyday hospitality when people come and visit. But it's also very, very important for household rituals and community rituals that are celebrated by large groups of people. And in particular, the jars that are used on those occasions are the very best jars that the household has to bring out. Uh, so um, the household of a rural community not so long ago would have had both stoneware jars and earthenware jars in its repertory of basic, usable, useful possessions. Although um, in this picture you also see the edge of a plastic bucket, so in a way this is a, a sign of where things were going, even here in re relatively rural southern Laos. The large jars again would have had possibly rice in them or would have had water. The smaller jars would have had drinking water, this, the earthenware pots. And so this was the pairing of these two different kinds of ceramics in mainland Southeast Asia, um, at least until recent time, each serving its own um, distinctive role in the household. The one could not replace the other, although both could be replaced by um, piped in water or electrically powered refrigerators and gas stoves and so forth. Um, going back now to these mappings, um, this is a map of all of the stoneware sites we visited um, in the area we covered, both along the coast in Vietnam and um, in the interior. And um, there are historically two different patterns of stoneware technology used, uh, found in these two regions. And the um, Australian archaeologist Don Hine has written a wonderful paper about this distribution of two different types of kilns and therefore uh, larger patterns of stoneware technology um, in the region. And he's termed them the interior style and the coastal style. I can't go into that here, but his paper is on the website that I'll give you the address for at the end of the talk. And it's a very thought-provoking and interesting paper. And I'm not going to talk about the stoneware that's produced um, in places like Singapore by um, potters migrating out of China. And now, thanks to talking with Sharon yesterday, I know that Lots of potters also migrated into Hong Kong. Um, this is a different kind of more industrial scale production. Um, and as a reminder, I'm really focusing on um, village-based production. So to look um, again at this map, um, I, you may notice that there are no um, national modern political boundaries on the map. And we did that intentionally because we wanted to think about the way in which these um, 
communities of technology relate to one another in ways that may contradict the modern borders that keep people from interacting. Uh, but um, you see basically um, stoneware sites distributed along the coast in Vietnam. You see them a bit further north in areas of uh, Cambodia and a high concentration in northeast Thailand and Laos, which is the largest single area that continues to produce. And then up at the top of the map, a couple of sites in southern Yunnan uh, by potters who are um, connected linguistically and culturally to the potters working in Northeast Thailand and Laos. The stoneware production um, in Northeast Thailand and Laos uh, is done, as I said earlier, by men, and they work in teams. One of the team members is called the shaper or the maker, and the other is called the spinner. Here the shaper is seated at work and the spinner is busy uh, rolling out long coils of clay that the shaper is going to use to build the base of a pot. And you can see that the two of them are working at a row of wooden wheels. Uh, sometimes there are as many as ten wheels in this row. Depends on what the workshop has access to or what survives. These are wooden wheels cut out of uh, chunks of, of large trees. And unfortunately, trees of this size are very hard to come by nowadays. And so the wheels that are there are ones that were made earlier that survive. Um, but sadly, one sees old rotting wheels in the corner of workshops that are just um, termite damaged beyond any use. And the modern uh, replacement is a, a metal wheel head, a modern wheel style. But um, the shaper, uh, the maker, uses coils to, um, using the uh, wheel head as a turntable and turning it with his big toe. You can't see it, unfortunately. His right big toe is hidden behind the pot that he's making. But he slowly turns the pot around while he coils up a shape that amounts to about half of the jar he's going to make. And then the um, spinner, his assistant, his, his, really his comrade, uh, sits down opposite him and with his hands turns the wheel very quickly in order to allow a process that amounts to throwing the pot now, using wooden ribs inside and outside to smooth out and stretch out and thin out the wall and consolidate the coils. So it's a very definite process of teamwork. Then uh, when, and, and when two men are working on a group of wheels, they'll make a group of shapes of this kind. And by the time they finish the last one in the series, the first one will be stiff enough that they can go back and add more coils onto the top and go ahead and finish the shoulder and the mouth of the jar, as they're doing here. Other stoneware shapes, such as mortars and the smaller bottles and so forth, are made um, in a single, um, as a single piece. But again, the teamwork is typically um, two people working together, very often, as in this case, husband and wife, um, working on this wheel, which both works both as a turntable and then as a fast wheel when needed. The pottery production areas for stoneware in Vietnam uh, stretch out in an interesting way along the coast. And all of the potters who are operating these kilns seem to be uh, ethnic Vietnamese, even though there's a great variety of ethnicity in Vietnam as there is elsewhere in mainland Southeast Asia. And it suggests that the kilns spread down the coast as the uh, Vietnamese uh, representatives of the Dai Viet Kingdom in the north gradually stretch south. And there's a, at least one stoneware kiln closely associated with each uh, large 
town, port city along the coast. But the interesting thing is that the potters in Vietnam are women. And it's impressive to see that they too can make big jars working in teams. Although they use a slightly different method, rather than taking a long snake-like coil and gradually building it up, the woman who's making the coils is actually making rings. And they get stacked and then uh, thrown and reshaped. So it's a, a subtly different production process. And of course, the gender difference is deeply interesting. And you can see all the jars in the background up in the upper left that are finished. But when we turn to earthenware, um, we encounter a far more complex situation. Uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, we began our survey thinking, oh, well, earthenware, it's all going to be this, made the same way. Um, what's to learn? Once we've seen it, we've seen it all. But by the time we went to our third or fourth village and started looking really closely, we started realizing that in the beginning, in particular, um, there is um, a profound difference that is the key difference to differentiating among these different types of earthenware production. The key is the very first step in forming the pot. It's the pot that many ethnographers don't videotape because it's not very exciting. The exciting part is when the potter gets out her paddle and anvil and starts whacking the clay and shaping the vessel. But this question of how the basic cylinder is made to begin with is what sets different groups of earthenware makers apart from one another. And this beginning form, of course, disappears by the time the pot is finished. So there's no way of looking at the finished pot and really guessing how it was made. You only can be there and see it made to understand how this particular community of potters might relate to others around it. Um, so here's the map of again, of all of the stoneware and earthenware sites, but um, most of these sites, especially in Northeast Thailand, are um, earthenware production. Most in Laos are earthenware. Most in Cambodia are earthenware. Um, most in Yunnan are earthenware. The, the earthenware producing sites vastly outnumber the sites where stoneware is made today. Um, we recorded with different colors on this map. Um, do I need to lean closer? I guess so. We recorded the, used different colors to indicate the different um, types of production that we were seeing. And I'll talk with you in a minute about some of those. Uh, we found six basic types of production that were differentiated by the way that preform, the initial form, was made. And um, we termed them type A through type F. Um, and I'm going to talk with you just about three of those, A through C, because um, they give the sense of what kinds of differences we encountered. Um, so these are examples of the three different types. Uh, type A found um, in particular in Northeast Thailand, Type B in Northern Thailand and Yunnan, and Type C um, in this case in Northeastern Cambodia, but um, uh, in a very distinctive distribution that I'll talk to you about later. So Type A, um, which we first encountered in Northeast Thailand and which was the starting point for our investigation, uh, Type A involves the potter making a solid cylinder of clay. You can see one standing in front of the woman who's working with the clay on a, a large flat basket, which is a common tool for potters in this area. And then she uses her thumb uh, to open up 
holes in both ends, both ends of that solid cylinder until she's opened it up altogether and it becomes a, a hollow cylinder. And when she's making a small pot, she'll just use one of those, but this is a modular unit, so when she's making large pots, as she was preparing to do here, she'll stack two of them on top of one another. And then she takes that now hollow cylinder, places it on an inverted uh, mortar, on a section of log, as she was using here, and she bakes the mouth of the pot first. Any of you who have gone to a pottery making class and learned how to make a pot on the wheel know that you start with the bottom and the mouth is the last thing you make. But the fascinating thing about earthenware is that it is done in reverse. The mouth shape is finished first and you can see on the far right um, she's finishing the mouth by walking around the stump with a wet cloth in her, between her fingers, uh, gripping, the, gripping the rim of the pot and shaping it perfectly by the movement of her own body around that preform. Then uh, she comes to the point where she's going to shape the body of the pot and here she uses the combination of tools called the paddle and anvil. The anvil is a clay uh, mushroom shaped knob that she's holding inside the pot with her left hand. Uh, the anvil or the paddle is usually, is always wood, sometimes bamboo. Um, and by striking the paddle against the anvil and moving the anvil carefully around the inside of the pot, in, in a highly complex way, she can take that cylindrical form and round it out and uh, make the final shape of the pot. And in particular, she stretches the clay down toward the base of the pot. You can see when she's starting, she still has a hole in the base, but she closes up that hole in the process of shaping the pot. And then she'll go back once the pot has dried a bit and uh, go over it once again and finish, uh, perfect the, f the round bottom form. So that's type A in, uh, in that case in Northeast Thailand. Type B, um, which we found in, mainly in Northern Thailand and also Southern Yunnan, uh, suggesting direct connections between people living in these areas, in, at least in terms of the exchange of pottery technology was quite a different process. And it suggests also a close connection to communities of people who are making stoneware. Because this type of earthenware preform starts with making a flat pancake of clay that becomes the base. And then coils are used to build up the walls. Finally, um, you can see the potter walking around her pot to make the rim, uh, but then she has to go, and, and then further shaping is, is done, but then she has to go back and with a paddle and anvil, very carefully uh, get rid of the flat bottom of the pot, because what she wants is a round bottom. So it's a kind of a illogical process. It's only logical if you think of earthenware potters closely replicating the way that stoneware pots were being made, but then adapting the final form to the requirements of a good earthenware pot, which is that it be round and therefore able to be put um, in particular over a fire based on, balanced on three stones. Type C uh, is found in uh, parts of southern Laos in northeast Thailand um, and in a few other areas and it begins in quite a different way. Um, the clay is again kneaded in one of those flat baskets but then a big lump of it is put on top of a post and the potter uh, makes the preform by pressing down uh, and making a circular channel in that lump with a projecting lump of leftover clay in the middle and the walls beginning to 
take shape on the outside. And then she takes out the excess clay, as you can see in her left hand on the right hand image, and gradually scrapes and pulls up the clay into the walls that will become the pot walls. She uses a rib, um, a palm rib, not an anvil at all. This, this technique does not involve paddle and anvil. And she smooths the outside, uh, first with that and then with a damp piece of cloth after she's formed the rim. And the final stage uh, is to use the right rib of a water buffalo. It has to be the right rib so it curves in the right direction uh, to round out the edges of that flat bottom pot. And you can see from the um, impression on the flat base that it was sitting on a large leaf so that it can be easily removed. She rounds it out, then she finally uh, uses a um, circular uh, tool made of rattan or bamboo, scrapes out the excess clay from the inside of the pot. You can kind of see that in the upper right hand image. And then finally, with a round stone from the river, she smooths the edges of the neck. So it's a process that departs from this use of paddle and anvil that is so uh, widespread in other parts of mainland Southeast Asia. Why that happens is one of the questions that still is nagging. Uh, having shown you how round bottom pots are made in various ways, I couldn't resist putting up this illustration from a very fine book on Chinese ceramics published by a reputable university press that shows a completely um, misunderstood idea of how a woman might make a round bottom pot. Any of you, again, who've tried to work with clay know that you couldn't possibly sit and build a hemispherical form like this with no support. Um, so it's too bad that people haven't looked in villages to see how the process actually happens. Okay, and um, this is a type B pottery production. You can tell because she's making a flat disc. Just wanted to give you a flavor, although this is an edited video, um, but how she's going to be working um, very quickly to form a vessel. Oh, and this was yellow. My, uh, my what? Alcon. 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 Okay. It's Liedem's voice in the video. He was able to talk with her because she is ethnically Thai, or the Dai, D A I, and so she speaks a language in the larger Thai, T A I family uh, that has relationships to. T-H-A-I and to Lao, and um, therefore communication was possible, which was thrilling. I never accept the term primitive for earthenware when I see someone working like this. I find this technique so um, <laughs> using such minimal tools and yet so sophisticated in the form that it can attain. Stones. So she finished the preform shape and now she's coming back with paddle and anvil to round out the, the vessel wall. No. No? What 
scenes of firing, and as you'll see in a minute, marketing. I realized I've talked on a long time, so if any of you have to leave for another class or whatever reason, please feel free to do so. It's 2 o'clock. But I wanted you to see this process of building up, in this case, a very small firing of the pots this woman had made and was going to take to market on the bus. this question of the type A and type B and type C, um, we, as we observe these variations, we asked ourselves, what accounts for this kind of variation? Um, what are the implications of these variations in ways to make earthenware? We uh, recognize that earthenware production in communities of women who are potters is a skill that is taught by older women to younger women. And what is taught is really a kind of embodied uh, performance. Very delicate relationship, for example, between the paddle on the outside and the anvil on the inside. Uh, it looks simple, but uh, it's hard to get a pot to really come out right. It takes time, takes practice, takes observation of senior potters at work. So um, this internalization of bodily movement in practice um, means that all of the potters in a given village make either type A pots or type B pots or type C pots. It's not a random distribution of technology. and. By extension, um, if we map all of the places where the type A process is, is being used, um, and this is one of the reasons we left the modern borders off of our maps, we find that we're mapping the kinds of social relationships that are embodied in this particular technological pattern. So um, one of our questions that drove us to go to all of these villages was where the boundaries of this, these technological styles lay. Could we trace them? Could we find their outer limits? And um, we tried, and um, to some extent, I think we succeeded. We started in Northeast Thailand, and then we just moved out in all directions to see what we would see. And in some cases, we found continuity over the borders. In other cases, we found we, we came up against a, a different type of production. 
though not associated again with the modern political border, it's just a border of technology. Uh, the type A map, um, the preform that starts as a solid cylinder, is concentrated in Northeast Thailand, and it's also found in parts of Cambodia and in the ethnic Khmer communities inside the border with Vietnam. So it's a, a closely associated with Khmer-speaking people, historically. The people in Northeast Thailand that use this technique are known as Thai Karat. Karat is a major city in the Northeast that was a garrison town for Thai soldiers in the 13th, 14th, 15th centuries. And the story of Thai Karat is that they are descended from Thai, uh, from local women who married Thai soldiers. So it's a mixture of two cultural patterns. The Thai Karat potters now spread out throughout all of Northeast Thailand. However, the main population of Northeast Thailand is Thai Lao. So there are only a few places where a type B uh, pottery production um, practice is, is seen in Northeast Thailand. And it seems instead that historically over the past couple of centuries, uh, the Thai Karat potters who were crowded into the area around Korat, increasingly lacking in land and other resources that would let them um, make a living by farming, turned uh, more and more toward an intense focus on pottery making as a way of making a living, and spread out into the whole of the Northeast area, and basically took over from the Lao potters. And the Lao potters, meanwhile, had other things to do, other ways of making extra income. And so they turned pottery production over to the Thai Korat potters who moved in. So one can find villages where the majority population of the village is uh, Lao, or Thai Lao. And then in one corner, there will be a little enclave of Thai Korat uh, families that make pottery. The Type B earthenware production was concentrated um, in uh, Yunnan and then in northern Thailand, although um, northern Laos as well. And this seems to be associated with a different kind of movement of potters, um, as I said before, possibly related to the movement of, of communities that also made stoneware movement in from the north, possibly from Vietnam and southeast China, um, that mingled with the um, older populations in mainland Southeast Asia. And type C production, uh, that production that involves the buffalo rib, uh, is much uh, smaller in the number of communities that practiced it and spread out in a very interesting way from the coast of Vietnam, where the potters who use that practice are ethnically Cham speakers, to potters in the central highlands of Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia. And then finally, if you see down in the Malay Peninsula, a few strange um, instances where the same technique is also found. So this suggests some kind of movement um, for reasons um, at this point that are hard to explain, but very interesting to uh, try to uh, think more about. So finally, um, coming back to the original map and wrapping up, um, the distribution, these mappings of types of earthenware in particular and their distribution uh, suggest a kind of history, and I'd use that in quotes, not as a um, absolutely documentable, but as a, a suggestion of a pattern of 
movement and uh, relocation in the past. Um, a kind of history that in the absence of written documents about the movement of, of most of these uh, communities within the region um, is a history that's really embodied in this spread of distinctive patterns of technology. And um, in conclusion, I'd just like to say that this study of both earthenware and stoneware um, for us um, offered a meaningful way of understanding the diversity of this region. At the same time, it raised as many questions as it answered. And I sincerely hope that other people will step in and carry on with intensive studies of particular communities. And some of this is being done by uh, Japanese and Thai ethnographers. But there's a lot more to do. And I hope some of you out there will do it. Thank you very much. So, <clears throat> thank you very much for uh, these talks. Uh, because previously, I also uh, conducted some research in Kamachina and Cambodia. So I know oh, that is yeah, it's it's not so easy to conduct such. You know, if you, if you can work on, on this uh, the pattern of all the pottery making in Southeast Asia, it takes a long time. And, very patient. So, really and uh, so right now um, we have the Q and A session time, and I want to ask a question first. It's about the gender uh, differences between the everywhere making why most of them are women, and for the stoneware is. Uh, this is the question. Sharon, I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can say. I mean, it's possible to observe that. Um, the women manage to integrate their pottery making with all of the other things they do in the course of a day. They work right under their houses. Their houses are raised on um, tall pillars, and so there's a cool, shady space under the house that's the workspace and the storage space and all-purpose space, and that's where the pottery gets made. Um, sometimes teams of women from the neighborhood will gather and work together. But remembering one woman um, who we watched through the course of a day, uh, we asked her when she would start to work, and she said, 4 o'clock in the morning. And we thought, well, that probably means daylight. But indeed, it meant 4 o'clock. And she got up and um, made 20 forms that she laid out that was going to be her day's work. Uh, and she cooked breakfast for her kids. Her husband went off to do something in the fields. Um, then she went back and started making the preforms. Then she uh, saw her kids off to school. Then she made some more, made the next stage of the pots. Then she did something in the house. Then she made some more of the pottery. Then something else came up. So she was it was fascinating to watch how this very demanding process, if you wait too long when you're making a pot, the clay dries out and you're lost. So it wasn't as though it was an arbitrary spacing of time. She really was watching carefully, but she managed to do all sorts of other things, like mend a hole in her husband's trousers and all sorts of other things that were going on. So it, it simply is to say that it suggests that um, it doesn't explain why women make pots, but it explains how women make pots in the midst of the other roles that they may play in their particular community definition of what a w women's responsibilities are. The making of earthenware, um, by contrast, is typically done outside of the village, partly because um, a big kiln is needed. The bonfire can be done right out in front of the house. It's not a problem. But the uh, sheds for working the stoneware and the kilns are outside the village, ideally in the past along the riverbank, because then the pots were rolled down and onto riverboats narrow, long boats that would carry them off to a market. Um, 
so um, there was that pattern, and we were told by some people that it just wasn't uh, proper for women to leave their households at night and be out firing the kiln through the night and so forth. But that really doesn't explain um, how this all came to be and what what social practices explained what um, divisions of technology or vice versa. If you go to India, all the earthenware pottery is made by men, uh, for example, almost all of it. Um, in Japan, it's all women, or it was when it was being made. Um, so it, it's just truly not clear. And it's, so it's equally not clear why in the interior, um, production of stoneware in Thailand and Laos, uh, parts of Vietnam, um, Yunnan, um, the potters are men, whereas in those Vietnamese kilns along the coast, the potters are women. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so I, I, these, I don't know if you have answers to these questions, but <laughs> I, I, I found it it's a fascinating talk. So um, I, these are just some of my thoughts, and maybe you have some comments on it. I, I loved, first off, I, I love the, the description of the pots uh, being used for refrigerating water and how people place them outside of, uh, along the roadside. I guess this is, I didn't write down where it was. It, it's Sorry. widespread. Um, and that, and that passerby could, uh, could just ladle some water to use it. So, and then you, you mentioned that refrigeration was something that came in and changed the dynamic of, of the pots, of how you use the pots and whether you even had the pots. Whether you use the so pots, I guess, yeah. So I guess uh, one thing I would wonder is how that sociality has changed in terms of, of, of assumptions that, oh, passerbys can drink the water. There's, there's a certain sociality among strangers, or not so strangers if it's a village situation, but but not necessarily this not household members. Not, not, a, not a guest, right? But people were just walking yeah. by. Uh, that would be changed. So I'd be interested if you, if you um, have a sense of, of what is it now? How is that sociality built now? Um, uh, what does it look like now that there, are there still, uh, if you have refrigeration in the house, are there still these things on the roadside or are those gone? Have they been replaced by you know, some other technique of, of kind of building that sort of stranger sociality? That's a wonderful question, and I wish I could say, oh yes, we did lots of research on it. Uh, we didn't, but um, in a funny way, those pots by the roadside have survived into a modern urban sense of timeless. For example, in um, outside fancy houses in Bangkok, you can see an intentionally built structure with a couple of northern Thai earthenware pots set there to look like they're offering water to passing strangers, although I never checked to see whether they actually had water in them. But, so this notion of the jar of water put out for anyone who needs it um, seems quite deeply rooted, but the real question I think you're asking is um, what kinds of changes would take place in a, in a village community where um, it wasn't necessary and it wasn't seen as a kind of cultural gesture in any case, but would that practice continue or not? I, I don't know. So here's the topic. But is that related to Taiwan Buddhism? Because water, it can be like a ritual water, and they may have some sacred things, so that the people pass it on. Um, I never, we never were told anything about any religious connotation of that water. It was really just for people who were thirsty and couldn't go all the way back to their own home to get a drink. So it was a way of the community taking care of itself in a way. But I, I don't know. I never thought to ask whether there was any further content, con connotation of water in that way. How did they find the clay for stoneware and earthenware? How did they find it? Yeah. Where do they find it? Or? Oh, how and why? Uh, <laughs> the, um, let me see, there are various examples. Uh, this, 
initially, certainly, especially for stoneware, stoneware production took place in areas where clay was locally available. Um, by the time we were looking at things happening, for example, that team of potters that I showed you, or the, the same people who made the jars on the right-hand side of the screen, um, people had uh, three-wheeled farming vehicles. They could hire other people to go and dig clay at a, a greater distance from the actual community that was making the jars and have it brought in out of areas that were in general known to have deposits of appropriate clay, but not necessarily anymore dug by the, the potters themselves who were using it. The earthenware clay uh, very often came out of the bottom of ponds outside the village itself. And the men of the community would collect the, the clay by actually wading into the ponds in their bathing suits very often and uh, feeling around with their bare feet, coming across a deposit of sticky, slippery clay, uh, holding their breath, diving down, digging it out, carrying it to the bank, and then um, gathering it up and processing it that way. Um, I also, though, saw women who had their place picked out and would, these were potters themselves, who would uh, use a, a, a digging tool and dig a hole, um, in a fairly large hole that they went back to time and time again to dig the amount of clay they needed for a small uh, group of pots to be made. Other stoneware sites, um, sometimes you could come across quite large areas where the potters were still digging their own clay, uh, where they had burrowed into the, the ground and were following veins of clay. So it, it varies quite a bit from place to place. But um, local availability was clearly the original motivation. Yes? Uh, the questions that I mentioned there Oh, sorry, it looks like we have a 2.30 class, so oh, make okay. it quick. Okay, okay. 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 So maybe, maybe you can discuss with Louis after the talk. Okay. okay. So, yeah, because the time is present for the, um, the lesson, so we have to stop here. And um, a, and I want this one. Uh, as Louis will be the keynote speaker for our Global Job Conference, uh, in Hong Kong Baptist University, and tomorrow she will give uh, her other keynote speech uh, in Hong Kong Maritime Museum. It's free of charge. So if you are interested, you can register. Yeah. Yes, here. I forgot to give yes. you the website for um, the article by Don Pine that I mentioned. It's um, the online catalog. And the videos, more videos of production are on the site below. Okay. Thank you for coming.